after Superbus had been exiled and Brutus and Colatinas are the consuls and then Colatinas is replaced, the Romans still fear that uh, Superbus was capable of coming back. That's what Livy tells us. They also believe that Superbus had collaborators within the city. And that, that turned out to be true, but nobody doubted that Brutus was committed to safeguarding the freedom of the city. That was not in doubt. Everybody so much trusted that Brutus was going or was committed to protect the city from any attacks, especially from the Tarquin families. But that trust they had in Brutus became a blind spot to what happened next. I welcome you to my YouTube channel where I explore ancient texts and try to find interesting narratives or stories in those books. At the moment, I'm going through the books or a series or collection of books often titled The History of Rome or From the Founding of the City by Titus Livius. This is a collection of books that were, was written around 2000 years ago and they cover the books cover the history of Rome from about 750 when Romulus or 720 something BCE when Romulus founded the city to around 0 AD when uh, Livy uh, passed on. Subscribe if you've not subscribed so that you don't miss any of the videos I, I upload. After the exit of Tarquinia Superbus and him being sent into exile, there were young men especially of high birth in Rome. These were young men, mostly who belonged in the uh, royal family or of nobility. And these young men uh, had gotten so used to an easy life, uh, Livy described this as they were accustomed to live a, in a royal fashion. And most of these young men were friends and companions of the young Tarquins, in particular the sons of Superbus, that is Sextus, Titus, and Aruns. So these young men, because of their closeness to power, because of being friends to, to the sons of the king, and also because their own families were basically uh, royalty in some way or of nobility, they were so used to a different kind of lifestyle than what everyone else lived. And so when the monarchy ended, they found themselves in a territory where things were not as, as beautiful for them as they were before. And uh, in particular, they, they missed the freedom from the law that applied to everyone else. Like there were these laws that everyone else had to follow, but not them because they were close to power. They couldn't follow these laws. And so the, the Republic comes. Now everybody is expected to follow the same uh, laws. It didn't matter where, which family you came from. And they found that to be a little bit unacceptable. And they, they really struggled with being treated equal to everyone else. Because of that, these young men became useful to Tarquinius Superbus, who still harbor the ambitions of coming back and taking his throne in Rome. There is this time when Superbus sends envoys to Rome in pretext that he is sending them to come and talk about his private property, land and other things that he owned, because he wanted the consuls to release this property to to him. So he sends these invoices to Rome to come and negotiate that. But it was a pretext really. This invoice had come to try to talk to some people to try to organize a way that the king can come back. And these envoys come back uh, into the city and they engage the Senate of course about the issue of the property. But at night they are meeting these young men who used to enjoy uh, power when the king was uh, in the throne and they talk to them and try to, to negotiate with them how they could help have the king come back and take the throne. So the list of the conspirators is very interesting. It included Vitali and Aquili. These two were brothers-in-law of Brutus. Their sister was married to Brutus. The, the others were Titus and Tiberius. These were sons of Brutus, uh, actual sons. So these young men meet these envoys, they talk, they agree, and in the end, they are requested to write a letter and sign it a letter this envoys will carry to, the, to Superbus as a proof that they indeed did have conversations with young men in Rome and they've agreed to help him come back to power. And they, they draft a letter. It turns out this envoys were like to live like tomorrow. This evening they go to a dinner at Vitali house and they are having dinner there and they are discussing these details and they have this letter and they hand over, the young men hand over this letter to the envoys. Turns out one of the slaves in the house overheard this conversation and he goes and he reports it to the authorities. And in fact, the, uh, the consuls, that's Brutus and his colleague, they come and they arrest these young men and these envoices. And these people are arrested, but the envoices are let go because it seems like there was an international uh, law kind of like that guided how envoices should be treated, which I found to be interesting because even today, diplomats, for example, there is a, a different way they are, are treated even when they break the law. seems like this thing has been happening for ages. So 
these invoices are let go because of that international uh, law that existed then. But Rome reacts through the Senate and first they seize all the, all the property of Superbus, the property that he, he pretended he was trying to have released to him. And they distribute his wealth to the people and they take pieces of his, some land he owned and there was corn growing on it and they let people go there and cut down the corn and throw it into, into the river Tiber. And Livy tells us that corn was a lot such that it went and formed an island. The traitors, uh, that is Brutus' uh, brother-in-laws and his own sons and other young men of nobility, were rounded up and they were charged and they were sentenced to, to death. Uh, this was, was a big test for Brutus, really. Because on one side, he wants to protect the freedom of the city. But on the other side, he has these sons that are facing death, his own sons. And he's kind of like being torn apart. And Livy tells us that uh, it was Brutus who was to oversee the execution. And indeed, he did go and oversee this process. And Livy tells us that um, when these young men were brought in to be executed, everybody, while there were so many of them, everybody was so focused on the sons of Brutus. They were looking at their father and they were seeing a man who was in a very difficult position. And in fact, Livy tells us, while Brutus was doing everything the way it was supposed to be done, his body could not hide the pain he was going through. Uh, seeing his own sons being uh, executed was uh, very painful to him. And in fact, Livy does say that his countenance betrayed his feelings. So it was a very sad moment for Brutus. But he did preside over that and it happened. His sons, alongside other young men of Rome, Rome especially from the noble class, were executed. Uh, when Tarquinia Superbus heard about this, he decided now it was time to go to open war with, with Rome. And he goes talk to neighboring Etruscan cities, in particular Veae and Tarquini. Now, Superbus conveniently at this time identified himself as an Etruscan, even though he wasn't. His father was not. His father was a, a Greek uh, from Corinth. But he decides to identify himself as an Etruscan because his grandfather came to the land of Etruscans in Tarquini and settled there and married a local woman. So he decides at this point to identify himself as an Etruscan and for a reason. He wants these people to see him as one of their own and to give him an army to go and fight the Romans. And in fact, there and Tarquini, they accept to give him an army and they put together an army and they march on Rome. Of course, Brutus and Publia, Publius Valerius, the other consul, know about this and they organize themselves to wait for this attack. And Livy tells us that uh, while Brutus led the cavalry, Valerius led the infantry. Now they go face this army from Vea and Tarquini, and the army is led by Tarquini and Superbus himself and his son Arun, Arun Starquin. And uh, when Arun Starquin sees uh, Brutus from afar, he is so bitter, and this is what he says, that is the man who drove us from our country. See him proudly advancing, adorned with our insignia. Ye gods, avengers of kings, aid me. He says this, this then he started running on his horse towards Brutus. And Livy tells us that he rides very fast to Brutus and Brutus can see him coming. And Brutus knows that this boy has identified him and the boy is coming for him. And Brutus charges on as well. And they meet in the middle ground and Brutus has his spear up high and uh, Arun has his spear up high. And both of them strike at the same time at each other and they both fell down and they were dead. That's how Brutus died. Uh, at the end of it though, the Romans under the command of Publius Valerius uh, win the battle or the war and the enemies run away or they, they flee. Livy tells us that Brutus was mourned for a very long time. Uh, for a whole year, the Romans mourned him. After a short moment, uh, Spurius Lucretius was elected to replace Brutus as the next consul, but he also died a few days later. He died of old age and then Horatius Pufilas was elected in his place. So that's how Brutus in the end, he was a hero, yes, but he was a sad man. <music>